Welcome and thank you for joining us for this webinar presentation. We are the Cybersecurity and Information Systems Information Analysis Center, or CSIAC, one of three IAC domains in the DoD Information Analysis Centers operating under the Defense Technical Information Center, DTIC, within the Office of the Undersecretary of Defense for Research and Engineering. Our informative webinar series highlights current and emerging research and technology developments. It presents an opportunity for accelerating the DoD's leverage of these advancements by increasing awareness and fostering technical collaboration. CSIAC serves as one of the premier information research partners and curators of technology advancements and trends for the cybersecurity and information systems community. As such, our organization supports those working in the cybersecurity and information systems domain of DoD research and engineering. We do so by helping navigate the vast landscape of scientific and technical information, allowing our customers to get a head start on their technical projects. With an understanding of the cybersecurity and information systems DoD research and engineering landscape, we provide research and analysis services. We help unlock access to information, knowledge, and best practices from government, industry, and academia to stimulate innovation, foster collaboration, and eliminate redundancy. We hope you enjoy this webinar presentation and that it serves as a catalyst for community collaboration and improved DoD cybersecurity and information systems research. Thank you everyone for joining. Uh, my name is Philip Payne. I am the technical lead for the Cybersecurity and Information Systems Information Analysis Center. Uh, before we get started today, I would just like to note a couple of administrative items. First, if you are dialed in by phone and would like a copy of the slides, they were posted to the CSI webinar announcement. You could go to csiac.org forward slash webinars and find today's webinar. When you click on it at the bottom of the announcement, it will say to view webinar PDF, click here. Uh, second, all participants are muted, but feel free to chat using the attendee chat button on the left-hand side of the webinar screen. You can chat with each other, and I'll be monitoring that chat as well. However, if you'd like to pose a question for the Q&A session at the end, please use the audience questions tool at the top center of your screen. That is the icon that looks like a chat bubble next to the file folder. At the end of the presentation, I will go over the Q&A. Uh, for the benefit of those on the phone, I would read the question out loud to the presenter. Uh, if you have any technical issues during the presentation, have no fear, the full presentation will be available online. Please check back to the CSI website. Once the webinar is posted, the GoToWebinar button will take you to the YouTube link. Um, and with that said, I'll hand it off to today's presenter. Thank you. Thank you for that intro, Phil. <clears throat> All right, everybody, uh, welcome. I'm Kevin Hendricks. I'll be the presenter today on understanding distributed blockchain end-to-end -end encryption communication services. Um, I'm going to be turning off my video for the remainder of this webinar just because uh, it'll help with prevent with packet loss. I am currently on a hotspot because the power went out here uh, due to some gale force winds. So I will see you guys at the end. Okay, so let's get started here. Um, who I am and why you should listen to me. Uh, well, I'm the presenter, so you have to listen to me for the next hour, but um, I am active law enforcement. I've been in law enforcement for 16 years now. Uh, I've served with two federal agencies um, as a task force officer in my capacity. Uh, I was with the Federal Bureau of Investigation for about four years, and then I was with the Drug Enforcement Administration for three, uh, combating uh, cyber crimes as we know it. Uh, I'm a certified cyber crime examiner and a certified cyber crime investigator through the National White Collar Crime Center. I'm a uh, certified cryptocurrency investigator through the Blockchain Intelligence Group, and I'm one of 60 people that have Oh, I have a black screen and no sound. Okay. Um, uh, Phil, uh, someone's saying they can't see me. I don't know. Did I do something wrong here? Um, uh, I'm a CCI through the Blockchain Intelligence Group, um, a CDAP through the Global uh, Digital Cryptocurrency uh, Asset, uh, Digital Asset Cryptocurrency Alliance. I'm one of uh, 60 people in the world that have that certification currently. Um, I was a presenter at the 2020 Joint Criminal Opioid Darknet Enforcement Conference on Android Emulation Software, and I'm um, a recognized SME by the CSIAC, uh, Homeland Defense Information Analysis Center, uh, all those alphabet uh, acronyms we saw in the beginning video there. 
Uh, if you aren't part of the subject matter expert network, I highly recommend you get involved with it if you're uh, contributing in this field. I'm a member of the High Tech Crime Investigators Association. My crowning achievement is I'm the founder of StopDarkWebDrugs.com, uh, the Ubivis project, uh, a portal for reporting of dark web vendors. And in terms of what else I do uh, in an investigative purview, I'm a member of the United States uh, New York uh, Secret Service, New York, New Jersey Cyber Fraud Task Force. Okay, enough of that. Key learning points for today's webinar. You're going to understand the difference between centralized governance messaging services like Telegram, WhatsApp, and Signal, comparative to federated distributed governance messaging services like Tox, Session, and Matrix. You're going to understand the evolving trends and trade crafts with thre threat and criminal actors and their preference to utilize these federated distributed messaging platforms versus the traditional uh, messaging services out there that I'm sure some of you have heard of, like the ones I just mentioned. And you're going to see a live demonstration of talks and session uh, for familiarity of the software nomenclature and just see how the messages present themselves. So I probably mentioned a few apps that you're very familiar with. End-to-end um, -end encryption has become the communication zeitgeist um, for our post-Edward Snowden uh, generation here. Um, more people use end-to-end -end encryption services comparative to actual telecom networks. I believe a study was released about that uh, concerning the uh, uh, people that are actually using these apps worldwide. Um, traditional end-to-end -end encryption apps like Signal, WhatsApp, etc., they have a central authority in the server. So what does that mean? Well, when you think of traditional logging into your account, right, whether you're logging into your email account, or whether you're logging into Facebook, et cetera, et cetera, there is a central governance of the, those services, meaning that your username and password are compared to a database where it's supposed to be stored. Um, when you start to talk about centralized governance, uh, such things as push tokens, super cookies, et cetera, those are all part of the process. So with Telegram, when you sign up for Telegram, it just requires you to have a one-time passcode sent to a phone number. Once that happens, that creates your push token to log into the Telegram servers, to log into your account. Now, when you start to talk about things that are progressing uh, in the technology field, specifically blockchain technology, I'm sure some of you have heard of something called Web3. Uh, the autonomous internet per se. So with the advent of blockchain technology, the implementation of decentralized governments is the foundation for uh, transference for data. What does that mean? Well, when you talk about blockchain technology, it's autonomous, right? It regulates itself per se, uh, or rather the people that contribute to it uh, are like the mining pools for the Bitcoin blockchain or the regulators. There isn't one centralized authority that controls that blockchain. They may maintain it as a conglomerate, but there isn't somebody that controls the blockchain. So utilizing blockchain technology, if you aren't aware of this now, um, hopefully you take something else away from this webinar. Uh, such dark nets that are out there, like ZeroNet, is built on the Bitcoin blockchain. LokiNet is built on the Oxen blockchain. And IPFS, which stands for the Interplanetary File System, have successfully been achieving anonymity, anonymity for uh, site hosting and the end users via blockchain technology. So new end-to-end -end encryption apps, as well as messaging platforms, have been able to utilize decentralized and distributed protocol to achieve anonymity and protection for their users. Uh, one such that I don't talk about is XMPP, uh, Jabber, that's a federated service as well. But today we're going to be discussing three of the services you might not have heard of before this webinar, and that's going to be ToxChat, Session, and Matrix. So understanding ToxChat the different versions, software, et cetera, and how to investigate it. Uh, if you're not aware, more and more bad actors are using ToxChat. So it's becoming the preferred end-to-end -end encryption app used by threat actors on the dark web as well as the deep web forums. It's important for under investigators and I guess just regular people who are interested to be familiar with it and understand how it's utilized as well as the possible investigatory avenues. So I, if you haven't heard of WickerMe, um, WickerMe used to be the preferred method of communication for darknet market vendors as well as cyber threat actors. Uh, it was a app that you could download on your phone, um, and it was purportedly at the time more secure than Signal and uh, Telegram. And as you may not know, and if you do know now, as of December 31st, they're going to shut down WickerMe. So how did this all happen? What, what exactly transpired in the past couple of years? Well, Amazon acquired Wicker back in 2021, 
And once that happened, all of a sudden, everybody started to get weary of using Wicker, specifically the threat actors out there, as well as the uh, criminal actors. They were uh, anticipating that Wicker was now going to become part of the machine that would respond to legal notice or be able to be compelled to release data on its users. And in typical fashion, uh, the notorious Edward Snowden tweeted about it, uh, saying that he does not use Wicker anymore. Um, claiming it takes money from the CIA, and uh, if you are using Wicker, that you should cease to do it. And now we go to what I like to refer to as the uh, the new advent of people using blockchain technology as well as federated governance for their end-to-end -end encryption apps. So since the summer of 2021, there have been more threat actors on the dark web utilizing the service TalkChat. Again, XMPP and Jabber remain popular, but Talks is becoming a contender in the room. So these are screenshots from specific darknet um, forums, et cetera, where you can see these threat actors advertising something called Tox. So if you don't know what Tox chat is, you're not gonna understand what you're looking at right here. Your Tox ID is a alphanumeric string of characters. You cannot search for people on Tox by any type of handle or moniker. You can only message people if you know their Tox ID. That's important to understand. So to go download Tox, if you're interested or you want to learn more, just go to Tox.chat. Pretty simple, Tox.chat. <laughs> so you can read about why Tox was formed, um, what their end game is, how they are able to achieve not only encryption of the data in transport, but how they can ensure that um, the end users are protected. Um, so this really isn't blockchain, I should say. This is more just standard federated governance. But in the different versions of uh, ToxChat, you have QTOX, UTOX, Toxygen, Toxic, and the mobile version, ATOX, which is for Android. So QTOX and UTOX, these are pretty much the standard that will run in a Windows environment. Um, they're not really incorporating anything into the Mac uh, system as of yet. And based as, I guess, as long as Tox has been around so far, they haven't had any effort to do so. So I tend to believe that it's probably not coming for Max anytime soon. But as you can see, there's different versions of it depending on your comfortable, uh, how comfortable you are in different system architectures and operating systems. But the two that you should probably be aware of are Utox and Qtox as well as Atox. So Atox is the Android client for it. You can download it off the Google Play Store. This is a very stable app and it is supported by the Play Project. It's not some homebrew app per se. So if you go to the Google Play Store, you can see the nefarious evil corp .ltd, uh, were the ones that uh, put this out on the Google Play Store. And when you look up Reddit, you can see people talking about Tox. Um, kind of isn't as much support as it originally had within the past year or two of people talking about it, utilizing it, because I think there's more competition out there now. But you will have a lot of people that are very, very uh, adamantly pro-tox when they start to uh, uh, talk about why they use it and the different variations of tox that they do use and how it keeps them secure. Um, this is something interesting, too. Uh, if you know what Termix is, it's a completely uh, stable Linux terminal um, to run in your Android phone. And they've created a support for it with Toxic, uh, which runs in the Linux environment. So uh, this is kind of the only variation between Toxic and Atox is someone could be running the Toxic version inside a Linux environment on their phone. Now, it's not uncommon for somebody to be advertising multiple Tox IDs. And the reason for this is because there's no way for you to log into your Atox account on your desktop and vice versa, because there is no password. There is no credentialed process. So for enhanced security, uh, this is something important too, if you ever come across somebody that is using a variation of Tox, you can encrypt the Tox client on your desktop with a password. If you come across somebody ever, if you're an investigator and you see this screen right here, you cannot bypass this. No matter how hard you try, if you do not know that password, you are locked out. Once you do use this password, it decrypts it locally. This isn't a password to log into their Tox account because there is no type of password system. This is to simply unlock the uh, version of the, uh, the com uh, software on that person's device. 
So again, you cannot search for tox users. You can't communicate with them. Only if you know their tox ID and they shared it with you, will you be able to send any type of messages back and forth. If you're interested in the encryption process, um, exactly how safe your data is in transit and once it's decrypted, uh, definitely check out ToxChat. They go into it pretty heavily there. So you're probably sitting there going, Kevin, uh, you know, you're really scaring us with all this stuff. How do I investigate a suspect using Tox? Well, this is pretty straightforward. Um, what you're looking at here is global packet radio services. Um, to be very abridged, this is what goes on on the back end if you're using your data plan with your phone. Every type of app, every type of thing that you see uh, has some sort of communication with the internet. This specific person was using Tox. Now, how do I know they were using Tox? Well, I highlighted these two specific IP addresses here. Um, this is um, what's from AT&T, which is called FlowLogic. This is no different than what Verizon or any internet service provider like Comcast, et cetera, would provide you if you're looking for somebody's internet uh, usage. So that specific IP right there, 81.169, if I go to the publicly listed Tox bootstrap nodes, which you can easily look up, you can see that that specific IP address is listed on the Tox bootstrap nodes. Now, it's important to understand that there is no real, uh, I want to say indicator besides this that somebody's using Tox. It's not going to appear as some sort of API. It's not going to represent itself that way in people's, uh, I guess, flow logic, GPRS, mobile IP sessions, or regular IP sessions. So as long as you see that specific IP address, you can know that they were using Tox at that specific time. Other than that, you're kind of out of luck. Um, again, the data in transport is pretty secure from uh, from node to node. So any type of investigatory furtherance of possibly intercepting and decrypting, uh, you're kind of out of luck there. Uh, but just to know that your suspect was using talks at a specific time, that could be uh, the, the key that you need to move forward. Now, if talks didn't leave you scratching your head, get ready for session. This is actually built on a blockchain. So what does that mean? Well, I'm sure some of you have heard of cryptocurrency. Maybe some of you have lost some money in cryptocurrency or own some dog theme coin, but there are other implementations for cryptocurrency. And one of those implementations is obviously uh, the usage of the blockchain for other purposes beyond transactional value. And that is where the Oxen Privacy Tech Foundation comes in, OPTF.NGO. They're based out of Australia and they maintain the cryptocurrency Oxen's blockchain. You probably have never heard of Oxen before, um, but Oxen is its own token, has its own blockchain, and you can stake ownership on it. You can buy into Oxen at different uh, tier one level exchanges. But what makes Oxen's Privacy Tech Foundation different is they have the end-to-end -end encryption messaging service Session built on it, as well as the Darknet Loki Net. Now Session, uh, unlike Tox actually show, actually has support for both Mac and Windows, as well as iPhones and Androids. So this is how you're, it's going to look when you pull it up. Session IDs are pretty much the same exact thing as Tox IDs, but they are an alphanumeric string that will begin with a zero. So somebody is on Tox uh, on session, even though they have a novelty name here like Mainway. Um, I'm not able to search for this person. I would have to know their Tox ID and attempt to reach out to them that way. Now, it uses a routing pattern similar to the Onion Router uh, network, and that's called Onion Routing. Um, but as the Oxen Privacy Tech Foundation puts it, it's actually Oxen Routing, not Onion Routing. But it's three points, um, your entry point, your middle or guard node, and then your exit point. And your exit point is where it communicates to whoever else you're using, uh, whoever else you're communicating with on session, where your data actually comes from is that exit point. Now, if we look at these IP addresses here, unlike ToxChat, none of these IP addresses are indicative of session usage. Um, these are all just random servers, really, across the world. So what you have here is uh, a very good way of people's uh, uh, actual usage of session being protected. If I were just to see those IP addresses, I would not know that the person was using session. Um, unlike LokiNet, which has built-in exit nodes that are recognized on uh, various uh, regional internet registries, 
Um, these do not say anything indicative of auction, OPTF, or session. So you're probably scratching your head going, well, uh, you know, tox was bad. This is a little bit worse. Um, well, there is one investigatory method out there. Session does not have the ability to onion route calls, if that makes sense. You can make phone calls, regular voice calls with session, voice over IP calls between each session user, but your data will come from where you are touching the internet. It will come off the network, the uh, the Oxen routing network. And the reason for that is, if some of you are familiar with Darknets, there was a project that was called Torphone that was originally implemented with Tor Chat uh, a few years ago, and they found out that it takes a while for that data to go through the network, the packets to go through the network. So imagine me talking to you with a 10 to 15 second delay while the slides progress forward. It wouldn't be a very fluid conversation per se. So if somebody does make a phone call using the uh, session, um, there would be a way through analytics of uh, voice over IP capturing, sniffing, et cetera, to see where that actual uh, IP address originates from. Now, granted, if they're not using a VPN or something in that regard, but that is really the only way that you could probably, quote unquote, break sessions encryption. Um, when you want to build an actual node, you have to buy into Oxen. So what does that mean? Well, if I want to create my own server space and have the Oxen be one of, or have my node be part of the Oxen routing for session, I actually have to buy into the Oxen blockchain. So that's kind of something interesting too. You know, you have ownership of both the token as well as the space on the Oxen network to do what you want with it. So again, the true IP addresses can be revealed in the current call feature. This would be the only investigatory technique. Now this is as of today, March 15th, 2023. Uh, OPTF may release an update to the software which completely mitigates this threat. But as of today, that would really be the only investigative technique in terms of uh, bare analysis versus some other techniques I might show you later. So now, unlike Tox and Session, I mean, unlike Tox Chat, Session actually allows public groups. This is something that's pretty interesting, especially if you are interested in extremist content, um, whether that's a foreign terrorist organization, whether that's homegrown violent extremism. Uh, you can join specific groups. So if you go to Loki Locker um, session open groups, these are groups that are open to the public. They openly advertise to join the groups. And you can also see the people that are the operators of those specific uh, session open groups. Again, um, if you join this open group uh, for whatever purpose you're doing it for, uh, whether that's collecting of evidence, um, they can see that you've joined, and uh, if they don't want you in the group, they can bounce you out. But you could also create your own private chats with other members, set the messages to auto-delete, et cetera, et cetera. Now, this is the last part of it. The real investigative monkey wrench, I per se, uh, is this is Matrix. So, uh, no, it has nothing to do with Morpheus, and Neo, and... Uh, anything like that. Um, think of this as the decentralized Mastodon and Discord. So if you go to matrix.org, you can see uh, what Matrix really is about. And it's pretty much uh, about federated, um, non-centralized governance like Discord and Mastodon have for chat rooms, for chat groups. Now, unlike Talks and Session, Matrix actually has a third-party credentialing uh, system, and that's Element. So Element is where you would go to actually create your account, if you wanted to do it this way, to log into Matrix. There's different, uh, I guess, third-party services that you could use, like your GitHub account, your Gmail, your MetaMask account, your Facebook, and your Apple ID to actually uh, almost like daisy chain your credentials into Element and then into Matrix. So that is really the only type of centralized governance per se that has that has a nexus to matrix again threat actors are using it already um, this if you don't know what you're looking at this is breached.vc very popular forum for data dumps hackers etc cetera, etc cetera. they have their own uh matrix channel which is very very active if you want to join it 
But you'll see people on here right now. This is on uh, exploit, another forum where they're advertising their matrix ID. This would be for direct messaging to this person. So if you're interested and you have matrix and you want to reach out to me, that's me, Mr. Thinned Thread. Not Thin Thread, that's a different profile. Thin th Thinned Thread, this is me, Thin Thread at Matrix.org. If you want to shoot me a message, say hello, send me some hate mail, say that you didn't like my webinar, I will gladly uh, field your messages. So this is one in the IPFS Open Matrix group. Remember, I said IPFS is a dark net. Uh, if you are interested in some research if you're if you are interested in people that are actually on the developer side of these new dark nets these new end-to-end -end encryption services this is where you want to go because this is where a lot of uh, in dev uh, devs are going to be posting some q and a's this is where you're going to see a lot of people talking about some uh, uh, i guess r d in regards to running these different services and different types of systems architecture things of that nature so there's a lot that you could do just going on uh in and really just paying attention to what's being said on these these forums so this is in the breached forums channel um now when you don't have a matrix account you can actually join as a guest just by clicking the link it will open in your browser and it will take you to the channel um, where you'll just be basically a, a guest in the group, um, especially uh, if you don't know uh, what to do from an operational security standpoint to, to create an undercover account, or if you have to go through a lot of process to do that, you can join these as just a, uh, a random uh, kind of guest to, to the room. But you'll find a lot of good content if you're interested just going to these, these channels and seeing what's being said. So how does it work, right? Well, Matrix does a lot um, on the back end to keep their users safe. If you're interested in exactly how this works, um, there's bridging, things of that nature that really get down to some network uh, intricacies. But if you're curious about it, uh, I would definitely recommend doing some, some good research. Uh, I think I could probably have a eight hour webinar just talking about a lot of the security features that are built in. But the commonality between all three of these platforms is the open, basically open source uh, support, the constant development that keeps being built into it to protect its users. And that's kind of the, uh, the real counter narrative to when you have centralized authority like Signal or WhatsApp or Telegram, you have a central authority that is pretty much updating the app versus a group of people that are doing their own research and development and creating the best versions for it out there. My opinion, these types of platforms are the future. When you start to talk about Web3, right, is that the future of the internet? I honestly believe it is. I believe that the future of the internet does fall into blockchain technology. Right now, we already have blockchain networks that exist, like the Darknet Loki net, um, sharing of files via IPFS, as well as the Darknet Zero net that's built on the Bitcoin blockchain. But when you talk about the blockchain domains that you can buy currently on the regular internet, like unstoppable domains, you can have things that are already being, websites that are already being hosted and the data of that website being hosted on blockchain technology. So I really feel that if you aren't aware of these services, you need to be uh, be prepared for it. So I'm a little bit ahead. Let me just look in the chats right now before I go live, because when I start to share my screen, I'm going to have to minimize this. Uh, okay. Yep, there's no questions in the chat right now. So I'm going to start to share my screen. Do you want to stop the content? Yes. Okay, entire screen, here we go. All right, so I am sharing my screen right now and let's go into session. So session right here, I double click on it. If anybody knows where that crashed airplane uh, monument is, I'll put that in the chat because some people have no idea where that is. I am part of a few groups already here inside session. But when I go on to session right here, you're going to see my path. 
So right off the bat, my path is geolocating, uh, or I shouldn't say it's not geolocating based on where I'm connecting to the internet. It has nothing to do with that, but it says United States is my entry node. My guard node is this uh, IP address right here, and my traffic is being trunked out of this IP address here in Germany. So if somebody were to be investigating me per se, trying to break sessions encryption, or trying to do something to when I'm file sharing, which you can do inside session, um, they're not going to see my true IP address. They're only going to see the IP of where my traffic is exiting on the Loki, uh, the Loki onion routing. So in this group right here is sessions open group. Again, this is where they talk about some R and D regarding different operating systems, things of that nature. You can see there's a myriad of support for different languages in here. Now, you could see these people's IDs, but you cannot communicate with them uh, if you reach out to them. And as sessions, I should say this too, they're alphanumeric string. Uh, if I try to reach out to them, it's not going to really let me unless I know their session ID. The alphanumeric string, I, I can't see their full session ID right here. I can see the name that they're advertising out here, but I can't see their full session ID. So these two guys right here, Chief and Workaholic, they're actually developers for the Loki net, um, Darknet. Um, so when they put out some information about new uh, versions of Loki net, um, stuff that you might want to update if you're using it, uh, this is where I want to pay attention to. So right now I'm going to log on to session using a different device. Um, I have a session on one of my phones, so I'm just going to shoot myself a message. Good question. All right, so I just saw something pop up. How do you send someone your session ID? Uh, they would be advertising it maybe somewhere on one of those forums or something in that regard to find them on session. So here we go, thin thread. That's me as well. I love bull terriers. I'm sending myself a message, hey, what's up? So if I look at my profile right here, I can set well, or rather, in this specific message between me and ThinThread here, I could set that my messages auto delete in five seconds. So, if I want to do that, let me just hide this. These messages will delete contemporaneously as they're read. So, again, uh, if somebody is sharing their session ID, there's other things that you can do here. Um, if I want to copy that session ID and I want to share it with uh, this guy right here, who I, same uh, thing right here. I forget which one is the one I'm on a message right now. All right, Mr. Scattered Castles here. That's who I want to message. So I've copied the session ID. I'm going to paste it. I send it to Mr. Scattered Castles here. Uh, that is me as well uh, on a different phone. And that is how he could start to communicate with uh, another person. So if I were to copy this and I wanted to start a conversation, I have to uh, send new message, enter the session ID. So I would copy and paste it into there and I would hit next. Now I already have a conversation going with, uh, with ThinThread, which is where I copied this session ID from, but that is how you would have to do it. And if somebody messages you and you don't know who they are and it just pops up that someone wants to talk to you, uh, kind of an operational security standpoint, hey, why does this person know my session ID? I don't know who they are. I don't want to talk to them, right? That would make the most sense. Uh, now, I have two different phones here that's running session right now. Um, my path on my one phone is different than the path that's on here. Literally, my devices are all next to each other. My entry node is the United States. It's a different IP address than this. My guard node is Germany. It's a different address than this. And my exit node is a different IP address. That's one phone. Let me pull up the other, my path on my other device. My entry node is Greece. My service node is uh, United States, not any of these IP addresses. And my exit node is the United States. Now, if I were to make the call, um, it's not going to let me make the call between these two devices. But if I were to make the call and I had some sort of sniffing software, um, I would I would definitely be 
exposing that actual connection um, since obviously my calls cannot be routed through the Oxen network. Um, it's going to show where I'm actually calling from. Uh, I just saw there was a chat message in there. Let me just go back to the chat really quick. Do you have resources or traditional? Um, Bradley, do you mean the data itself, like how that data is encrypted? Or is it, I uh, just want to make sure I, I can I can refer you in the right direction here. So for the last 10 minutes, um, we're going to go on to talks. Let me just close this out here. Now, anytime we're live, I always worry about doing stuff like this because I don't not sure how much bandwidth is going to be eaten up. So Q talks. This is one of the versions here. I could create a new profile or load a profile. This again is to unencrypt it on my device. There is no credentialing process for Tox itself. So this is for it to unencrypt on my device. And once it unencrypts, it will load on my device. Then it touches the Tox network. So I could create a new profile right now. Let's just do this CSIC webinar, password CSIAC webinar 2023. CSIAC webinar 2023. Create profile. And we're on talks. Boom. Once I go on to the network, it's going to populate. And we're going to see my profile right here. So I just created this profile. It now has touched the network. Okay, Bradley, um, if you want to go to the session, uh, getsession.org or talks.chat or matrix.org, they will explain the exact process um, of how their encryption and which different uh, protocols of encryption that they use. Um, yep, you got it, brother. Okay, so I just created this profile right here. Just created it. This profile has never been on the Tox network before. So right off the bat, I have my Tox ID right here. I'm going to copy uh, this Tox ID. So let me highlight it here. Click the copy. Boom, I've copied it. Now I'm going to log into a different version of Tox right here, which is Utox. So again, I have two different versions of Tox, but we're on the same system right here. Right off the bat, I have to unencrypt it. Boom. So this is the Tox I have set up for the Ubivis project. This is my Tox ID right here. If you go to stopdarkwebdrugs.com or ubivisproject.org, I advertise a way to communicate with me on Tox. Oh, okay. I just got a message from Bootstrapped Bill. Oh, okay. That's, uh, I guess I sent that a while ago. I don't know. Bootstrapped Bill is me as well. I have a lot of free time on my hands. Okay. All right. So search or add friends. So if I want to create a new message here, I'm going to enter this Tox ID for this that I just created. Um, where it said that I could have group chats, that's something that actually just was released within the past couple of months, but it's not like an open channel. It's a group chat for only people that are invited into it. So I've copied and pasted the uh, Tox ID for the CSIC webinar, Tox, uh, uh, QTox I just created. I message him. Now, I've just sent that message right here. So now I have an alert inside of the CSIC webinar. It says accept friend request. So this is pretty much the process of me reaching out to somebody. We have to establish that connection first. I'm not going to be able to just send blanket cold messages. Uh, it's going to want me to basically accept them as a friend. So I can accept this or I can reject it. If I reject it, we're not going to be able to communicate. But if I accept it, it's going to allow me to start communicating with that person. So now there's a bit of a lag back and forth. Um, so right off the bat, you can see the difference here between the, the nomenclature for Utox and Qtox. 
Um, now, can we make calls back and forth? Again, uh, there's different theories out there um, with Tox users about the safety of not only making phone calls, but making video calls. But I could share files. And if I share files, which are pretty easy to do, let me just find one here to send a quick picture or something in that regards. Uh, right here, let me just send this picture. Now, I get this. It has to let me accept it. Okay, it won't let me. It's just a simple JPEG. But anything that somebody sends me, even though we're friends, I have to accept it. And it'll allow me to download it. So let me just download it uh, in documents. Since I already have one there. Boom. There we go. So it's saved to my device. It's an artifact for my device. Um, you have to have some sort of trust to do this. How do they know they're not sending you some sort of malicious malware, ransomware, et cetera, et cetera. But if I were to be doing any type of IP analytics or uh, data analytics, sniffing, et cetera, et cetera, I would just see this coming from whatever node I'm currently connected to with uh, the version of Tox that I'm on. I don't know if I'm actually connected to the same node, even though I'm on uh, the same device. Uh, the only way I'd be able to determine that is if I had some sort of sniffing or some sort of uh, analytic IP uh, or packet uh, packet transference analytics. And since I'm on this live webinar, it'll probably be eaten up most of my bandwidth. So I would only see the data really going out to the webinar. But with that being said, I'll pop back in here and I will progress the slides. Hold on one second, let me close this out. Uh, let me turn on my camera actually, so you can see me again. And um, I just want to open it up for questions if anyone has them. Uh, Phil, could you put the slides back up, please? Um, just so I think I have my contact information at the end. Sure, no problem. Uh, first and foremost, thank you uh, for that presentation and that demo. Uh, I think it was a little bit more technical than maybe some of our past uh, presentations, but uh, I think that was actually a great thing. Um, at CSI, we strive to be cutting edge and state of the art. Um, so hopefully you see that some of the things that you may see in pop culture and the emphasis on artificial intelligence and machine learning and blockchain has been referenced in some of our recent offerings to include some of our webinars as well. Um, so as, as Kevin said, we may not necessarily be uh, cybercrime investigators or doing forensics, but I think a presentation like this is important for the Department of Defense and the federal government to kind of be familiar with some of these services and kind of understand that uh, our adversaries and uh, some criminals out there are already using these things successfully. So um, I think the more knowledge you have, as Kevin showed, is uh, we can use these, uh, you know, whether in personal life or on, on the job, um, but I think just being aware of them uh, is kind of the first step. Um, but we do have some questions. Um, okay, so we'll, we'll start the Q&A now. And then um, yeah. I'll, give, I'll give Kevin a chance to answer those. So, absolutely. Um, this question we have is from Scott. He says, Do you expect that call routing capabilities will be integrated into these types of services? So, they are always talking about it. I think that's like the hot topic that always comes up uh, when people are talking about advancements of apps like Talks, advancements of apps like Session, because one of the good things about Telegram and Signal is the calling, right? That not needing to actually touch some sort of telecom provider, but communicating within the apps itself. Um, I would think that in order for it to actually move forward per se, uh, there would have to be a significant amount of uh, investments into these apps, whether that's through crowdsourcing or whether that's through the acquisition of it um, by a larger company, which is kind of the antithesis of why these uh, apps exist, you know, decentralized governance per se, not some uh, company that comes in like happened with Wicker. Amazon came in and bought it and now you know there's a migration away from it do i believe that they are going to integrate it I, I think so in terms of when blockchain technology really gets uh, more integrated i think you're going to see more opportunities for that right now it, it's especially with the advent of blockchain on the internet it's it's a little uh it's a little we're a little bit behind the curve in the uh actually what can be used on it and i think once it becomes more uh available there's more services out there like unstoppable domains things of that nature where you could actually park a domain on the blockchain 
I think we'll see more and more um, advancements in these types of apps or comparable apps that are going to come out. Um, as long as XMPP Jabber has been around, um, you know, they, they're still advancing. There's still different um, services coming out in support of uh, a federated app like XMPP. So uh, relatively speaking, Tox, Session, and Matrix are kind of new on the arena, but I think it's all going to going to play out as technology with advances so you can make the calls now you just won't be uh won't be as secure as the traditional legacy apps like signal uh, whatsapp and, and uh telegram next question has this been tested to and from a lockdown country like china so there are people on session uh and there are people on matrix that are in china so I would assume that yeah, they're they're able to 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 uh, circumvent uh, having to use uh, WeChat or whatever like they're supposed to use there, and they're on these platforms and and communicating. So I would say yeah, especially uh, with the dark nets like Loki Net and um, uh, other dark nets out there like uh, I2P and and, uh, and and Tor, you have a a, a very big presence. Um, just I think last week or the week before, IranFreedom.i2p uh, went live. So uh, uh, I, I believe that that's now an avenue for people in Iran to be able to to read about what's going on there. So that's that's important to understand that yeah, there's like some geopolitics that come into play with these app usages, and uh, there are already foreign terrorist organizations. There's already homegrown violent extremists that are using these platforms. So um, it's important to be aware of them, but um, yeah, I kind of got away from that, but yes, it has been tested in a lockdown country like China. I don't know North Korea. I, 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 you know, I don't know exactly if anybody there is using it. So, I'm afraid I missed, uh, missed how blockchain technology helps these social media apps. Um, uh, so, really, the app that uses, or rather, the the messaging service that utilizes blockchain, the purest form that is built on the blockchain, is session so the oxen privacy tech foundation is able to use the oxen blockchain to transfer data through whoever buys oxen they're able to set up what's called snaps on loki net which are the loki sites that ended dot loki as well as set up nodes for uh session so i think that that's what i meant Erie, and i apologize if i i didn't address it the correct way but um, the, the that blockchain is is how uh, Session and LokiNet function through the Oxen blockchain. It's a little bit complicated because Oxen is also a cryptocurrency, meaning you can buy and trade it. But in terms of a traditional cryptocurrency like Ethereum, Bitcoin, even privacy enhanced tokens like Monero, it, there's no one that's actually utilizing Oxen other than utilizing Oxen and buying Oxen to either build a site on LokiNet or uh, incorporate uh, their, uh, incorporate some server space or something to be an, a, uh, a node for session. Oh, yeah. Uh, yeah, uh, Phil, if you want to do that. I forgot. There's yeah. people called in. I'm sorry. <laughs> yeah, no problem. Um, got on a roll there. But that's that's great, though. I, I think uh, this shows the uh, the value of this session. We have a lot of people. Uh, interacting with us. We have a lot of questions. So obviously uh, the content of, of, of this webinar uh, was appropriate. Um, so the next question we have is from Dan. In your personal opinion of Tox Session Matrix, which present, which present the most difficult attack surface? Have major vulnerabilities been identified in any of these that would enable cracking through stored data, old chats in any of these? Mm. That is always the million dollar question, right? When you have this federated governance, it's basically everybody agreeing to play nice, right? <laughs> so if I were the going to be conducting a man in the middle attack per se, um, intercepting this data and uh, attempting to decrypt the data as it touches my server that I've dedicated for talks or I've dedicated the server space for session, um, I honestly think that they're very, very secure. Um, I believe that they built in some great protocol there. Um, Matrix is a little bit, Matrix is a little different because Matrix is is more akin to, uh, I wanna, 
I want to say it's more akin to XMPP, whereas, you know, it, it, depending on where you really have the chats and the, the, the channels hosted, it, you know, somebody could actually see that stuff. Um, I, I would say the most vulnerable per se would be Matrix, but not in the sense where you'd be able to find out who these people are. Again, that's operational security on, on the end user's end as well. You know, are you connecting to a VPN? before you connect into this service? Are you using a, a third party uh, credentialing service like Element or are you uh, you know, hosting your own matrix channel and, and, and doing it that way? Um, in terms of stored data and old chats, again, I, I think it comes down to, to uh, if you did get the data, how you'd be able to decrypt it. And I, I honestly think talks and session are very, very secure in that regard. I, I would think in my personal opinion, where you'd, you'd have the, uh, the, the best success rate would be something like matrix. Thank you. Our next question from Daniel, do you see this capability to be integrated into mainstream collaboration solutions from Microsoft teams or similar? When, how far off do you have an estimate? Uh, that's a great question. I believe that it is the future, especially when, you know, the, 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 the buzzword of web three, I just don't know when, um, and I don't know, uh, what blockchain they would build it on. Thank you. Our next question from Zachary, uh, he is interested in more info about the NW three C certification. Do you know if you need any direct experience with criminal criminal investigation work to qualify? I'm a CISSP, CHC, CSAP certified InfoSec person, but I'm not really into the criminal investigation field. Uh, that would actually be a good question to send to the NW3C, um, nw3c.org. Um, you can reach out to them. I do know they, they have uh, civilian um, uh, support there as well for people that contribute to the National White Collar Crime Center. So uh, that would be a question um, suited for them pretty much. I just have to show like my working CV. I have to renew it every year for my three CE and three CI certification. I have to, you know, talk about contributing to like webinars like this and uh, uh, expert testimony I've provided in, in, in court trials, things of that nature. But I, I would say, Zach, definitely reach out to them. Um, I, I would be curious myself. It sounds like you've done a, a lot of work uh, that's pretty much germane to to the certification it's just you know it's not in the law enforcement field uh, our next question from yuri do we know that those chinese participants successfully overcame the government restrictions rather than being mss related and allowed to join Ah, okay yeah so is it is it the uh a counterintelligence thing right uh <laughs> i don't know Again, I, I haven't engaged anything in, in regards to that. I, I can't read or speak uh, Chinese and I can't read or speak Persian or Arabic, but I do know that session itself became very, very popular during the initial uh, protests taking on in Iran. So popular that they actually had to incorporate the script into the, uh, into the platform. And they created a channel specifically for uh, Iranian um, uh, people. So uh, again, yeah, it could, you know, it could be the old honeypot type thing, like going into the chat room going, hello, fellow, uh, you know, <laughs> hello, fellow dissonance. Who else in here is, does not like the government, right? It, it is possible, but I do know that there is a presence um, with people from China that are communicating on session, um, are communicating on matrix uh, and also have a presence on uh, different dark nets that are out there. So uh, that, that would be uh, that would be a good, good question really um, to find out if they're just being led on and they're really a, a honey pot or if they are just organic users. And our next question from James, who is researching using blockchain for DOD exchanges? Where can we get documentation? Good question. Uh, Phil, that might be more in the wheelhouse of the DTIC. Um, I don't know. Yeah, I don't know exactly what, what uh, the DOD is doing in regards to uh, the usage of blockchain technology. Yeah, James, um, you know, that's something we can definitely uh, handle offline. Uh, a quick commercial for CSIAC and our technical inquiry services. 
Um, you know, everybody on here is, is a member of CSIEC. Um, you know, please submit technical inquiries for, for these types of questions. Um, yeah, I know that DTIC is doing some work on the back end as well uh, related to blockchain, but um, but yeah, submit that as a technical inquiry and we'll do our four free hours of research for you. So um, if there are any other questions related to research, then, you know, I'll take this time to kind of promote our technical inquiry service. But uh, but that's definitely something we can look into um, for you, James. Thanks. That's a good question. Yeah, it is. That is a really good question. Um, and then just a clarification from Yuri. Uh, he wants to to augment his DOD blockchain questions. What are they considering using it for? Yeah, there's there's just so many different use there's really anything that you could think of from inventory of wherever you know where where you know when you start to talk about the uh, dla or or logistical aspects of it um uh, i believe there's a study that's out there about walmart and the usage of blockchain technology for walmart the giant walmart corporation and their inventory to figure out um certain uh i guess uh, uh, metrics concerning uh, shipments and things of that nature so there's just so much that you can do with blockchain technology as it is it's that, that could be a separate webinar in and of itself <laughs> definitely most definitely yeah okay um, yeah. I, I believe yeah so that's that's scott is with us um if you, if you guys do not know he he is part of the iX um so at a high level um that is some of the work that you know uh, the DOD is using blockchain for. Um, we actually have a state of the art report um, relative to blockchain coming out soon with CSIEC. So um, if you guys have any questions and you would like to know more, then then by all means, get in contact with us on, uh, offline, submit technical inquiries. Um, this is what we exist here for to kind of force that collaboration. Um, so with that said, I believe that is the last question that we have. I would like to uh, uh, thank Mr. Hendricks again uh, for, for a great presentation. Um, I did post the link to today's webinar um, in the chat. Those slides are available now. Uh, like I said, check back to the CSI website uh, within a couple of days. Um, the recording will be on our YouTube page. Our next webinar will be April 13th. Uh, that will be focused on proving cyber survivability for West weapon system mission assurance. Uh, so we hope to see you guys then. Uh, with that said, we'll, I'll sign off for now. Have a good day. Thank you. Thank you.